a lot better than a lot of people thought it was going to be. Let's start with that. It is uh, it's rather surprising to me in some ways that it's done this well this long because I was taught at the University of Chicago and Northwestern that it was terribly important for countries to have savings and to invest a lot in the future. And that had a lot to do with how well they're doing. Well, America today has the lowest savings rate it has had in many, many years. At the national level, it's fallen dramatically from oh, 10, 11 percent of the GDP, as we call it, down to one or two. Personal savings rates, stunningly, have gone from 9 percent of our disposable income to a minus 1 percent. And we've become very gifted, uh, ardent, robust uh, consumers and borrowers and not savers. Now, the big question is, we become huge borrowers as a country with our very large deficits. We become borrowers at the consumer level with very hard debt levels and a really lousy savings levels. And the big question I have about the American economy is not today, but it's how long we think we can continue because we've got some huge challenges uh, that are coming. We have 78 million baby boomers twice the size of the current generation due to begin retiring next year. We have Social Security and Medicare that are programs that are where we made a lot of promises but we haven't funded them. And we've grossly misled the American people with such uh, euphemisms as uh, the Social Security Trust Fund. I argue and it's oxymoron, it shouldn't be trusted and it's not funded because the money's already been spent. And uh, we haven't provided for those programs. We are getting to be fancy language. We have something called a current account deficit which measures our deficits abroad, which is largely the trade deficit. It's now twice as high as a percentage of the economy as it's ever been in America's history. And we're borrowing, borrowing, and borrowing and becoming dysfunctionally and I think destructively dependent on the long run on Chinese money and Japanese money and Asian money and so forth in which they lend us this money. Funny thing about borrowing, you have to pay it back at some time. And as a country, we can't continue to borrow 7% uh, of the whole economy, which is what we're borrowing now, for very many years without looking like a very different America than we have now. So I think the, the economy today is in pretty good shape, though it's getting pretty turbulent now with housing. And housing is a wonderful example I did quite a study about 18 months ago and I was simply astonished at the number of people who bought homes no money down. It's called interest only. And then I was astonished that even though mortgage rates are at the lowest level in 30 years, they've averaged around 9.7% or something like that, and now they're at like six. People are not taking long-term fixed mortgages. About half of them are taking what are called adjustable rate mortgages. Well, one might say, gee, that's fine if we have a lot of savings that we've stacked away, and if we aren't borrowing very much for other purposes. That isn't true. We're borrowing uh, more as a percent of our income than we have in many, many years. So now we've had this big uh, blowout of the so-called subprime mortgage market. And today I hear on the press that housing prices are falling and so forth. 
What did we think was going to happen? How are these loans going to get paid back if we don't have any savings or already heavily borrowed? So my concerns about the economy of this country are much more in the future and much more of our culture. We have become from one of the biggest savers in the world. And saving, remember, is a metaphor for the future. Uh, we've become the biggest consumers and borrowers in the world, which is kind of another way of saying, I want it all, I want it now, and I don't want to give up anything. And kind of to hell with the future. <coughs> so I am uh, far more concerned with America's economic future 10, 15, 20 years from now than I am what happens over the next six months. I am planning uh, to take my bounty from Blackstown going public, a lot of it, and it's quite a windfall, and set up a, uh, what will turn out to be a very large foundation. And because I've been boring people relentlessly uh, for the last 20, 30 years about some of these problems, uh, I'm going to take a number of these problems that are uh, what I call undeniable and unsustainable and yet politically untouchable because of the political culture we now live in, where it's considered almost politically terminal to ever ask anybody to give up anything or pay for anything. And you know, I want more and more and more and I, I want it now. And to take these issues, which I think are a serious threat to America's future, and uh, take those issues where there's a huge gap between what we should be doing and what we could be doing and what we are or are not doing, and figure out how at the margin a major foundation might be able to make a difference. When I think of young people today, and I think of what we're leaving them uh, 10, 15, 20 years from now, you remind me of that old uh, joke in the philosophy class where the professor asked the students, which is worse, ignorance, ignorance or apathy? And some poor kid from the back of the class says, I don't know and I don't care. Well. I think it's an interesting question. Is there an exciting way that we could get the young people of this country aware and their parents? Because I refuse to believe that parents have suddenly become cold and indifferent to their own kids and grandparents. I think they've been uh, deceived and uh, misinformed and disinformed and so forth. So we have a political system today, for example, where the elderly are unbelievably well represented. The American Association of Retired Persons has 38 dues paying, 38 million dues paying members. They write more, they lobby more, they call more. And by and large, it's not too unfair to say a lot of their programs are, we want more, even though by any reasonable standard, as I say, some of these challenges are unsustainable. We can't, uh, we're not going to be able to meet the promises that we've made. So on the one hand, we have these, this culture of our ethic of uh, shared sacrifice being kind of a dirty word, not wanting to give up anything. We have political organizations who are dominant in representing one age group. And the young people who are all about the future are somehow being slipped this huge check, <coughs> hidden check, I might add, for our free lunch. And nobody seems to be doing anything about it. So I would like to gather together the student and the young leaders of this country and uh, take a day or two and say, I'll try to give you the biggest, best rundown I can in half a dozen areas of the economy and fiscally and what the world looks like.
And then I want you to contemplate that because it's not my future, it's yours. I'm 81 years old. I, Lord knows I don't need anything more. And ask you, what are the best ways to do something about it? And should we have an American Association of Young People and their parents, for example? Because until this democracy gets educated and gets informed, which is the first requirement, and then get active and motivated. Not much is going to happen on these problems unless there's a huge crisis and it'll be a very costly crisis when it hits. So that's a long-winded answer how I feel about the economy. I, I'm much more concerned about the long-term picture than I am over the next year or two or three. My parents' generation, the greatest generation, for example, fought the most costly war in history, costly in every sense of that word. They built international institutions, Marshall Plan and so forth, which was central to the world getting restored. They had GI Bill of Rights for all the returning veterans, went to college. They rebuilt the infrastructure of this country, but they didn't ask me to pay for it. They paid for it because they were willing to invest in the future. And that meant saving and that meant consuming less. I tell these university audiences, I think a careful study of your sociologist, of your social psychologist, of your political scientists, of your economists, of your historians, and say, what was it during those early times in where more Americans than I'm afraid today had a clear sense of the future and a responsibility for it? And what led us to this notion, I'm going to grab what I can, and the government owes me this, and the government owes me that, and uh, kind of to hell with other people, or to hell with the future, to hell with uh, who and how we're going to pay for all this. Now, why did that come about? What, what led to this boomer mentality, you know, about I want it all, I got to enjoy it. And, and uh, I have a dear friend who is in an aspect of the medical profession. He's kind of complaining that he's not a a um, millionaire or a multimillionaire or whatever. And I said, well, you know, one way people become millionaires is they save and they invest. But he's got to have his small airplane that he flies on the weekend. It's, he points out to me it's not a jet. And I said, well, I understand. I don't have a jet either. But, and oh, um, you know, I need to have fun because I work so hard over the week and I need a Porsche car, you know, and so forth. And that is the boomer mentality that we're kind of dealing with here. And I don't really know what led from saving and investing into the future, which consuming and borrowing now. Uh, did America get uh, disenchanted by the uh, Vietnam War that tore this country apart? Did we get torn apart by the assassinations of presidents and presidents' brothers and Martin Luther King and uh, riots in the streets? And uh, uh, I was, as I say, I was working on this problem in Chicago. It was a terrifying sight to see. And did somehow the bonds that unite us and heal us lead to the current situation? I'm not sure, but I have never seen a time when uh, there is so much uh, bitterness and partisanship and paralysis as we have today in our government. I mean, nothing. We went through important areas, areas where the Republican leadership and the Democratic leadership uh, united for a much long, larger cause.
namely the nation's interest. We've had very little of that recently. So I'm putting. I don't know what all the reasons are. I just know there's been a, a really major shift. I think, if I may, just to insult your medium, it entirely possible that television has had its impact. For example, I used to watch my children. I, in my era, there wasn't television. And they turn on the TV and pound it into their heads. Here's this toy they had to have. This is this dress they got to have. This is, and we've developed a kind of a indulgent, instant gratification consumption largesse uh, that has become part of our culture. And I don't, I, 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 I don't know all the reasons for it, but certainly uh, the presence of such an effective medium in television is probably one of the, uh, one of the factors. <laughs>